Welcome to the Sondheim Artscape Prize finalist artist talk series. My name is Ghani Chan. I am the co-curator of the Sondheim Artscape Prize exhibition and assistant curator of Asian art at the Walters Art Museum. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Jonathan Monahan. Jonathan is an artist working across a range of media, including prints, sculpture, and video installation to produce otherworldly objects and narratives. Drawing on wide ranging sources, such as historical artworks and science fiction, his fantastical pieces uncover subconscious anxieties associated with technology and consumerism. Past exhibitions include the Sundance Film Festival, the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, and the Palais de Tokyo in Paris. His work has also been featured in several media outlets, including the New York Times, Vogue, the Washington Post, and the Village Voice. His work sits in numerous public and private collections, including the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art and the Washington DC Art Bank Collection. Welcome Jonathan and congratulations on being selected a finalist. Thank you. Can we pull up the slides please? And so here is an installation shot of two of the works that you are exhibiting at Sondheim this year, Centuries mm -hmm. and Den of Wolves. Would you mind introducing to our viewers uh, what each of the two works are about? Yeah, sure. So you're looking at a work from the series Centuries, and there I have two works in the exhibition from the series. Um, these works are what I call like a wall uh, decal. They're um, an adhesive polyester canvas that's um, attached to the wall and they depict this rather strange and surreal and actually rather confrontational imagery. Um, so even though they look very 3D, they're actually flat, they're two dimensional and they are, uh, the imagery is created using uh, computer graphics software. Um, in fact, it's the same software and process that I use to create my animations, which we'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. And so these works are rather um, kind of confrontational, but they also have a, a bit of like a strange softness to them. There's a lot of soft fabrics and um, there's a lot of architecture that turns into like cloth that turns into um, uh, so it ta it's taking technology, it's taking Baroque architecture, and it's taking these soft fabrics and it's mixing them up in a very strange and surreal way. Wonderful. Um, and it, these works use, uh, the Centuries works use very colorful, uh, in, very colorful uh, color palette, um, but the imagery is a little bit uh, foreboding and a little bit strange and a little bit um, uh, kind of scary and ominous looking. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the works, uh, both in themes and also in the visual imagery, especially uh, as, as you're seeing here, uh, relate to a video installation that's in the exhibition called Den of Wolves. Mm -hmm. And Den of Wolves is a 19 minute long looping video installation. And this is sort of the main event in the exhibition. This is a, a piece that took me um, about, a, uh, about a year to make, or almost over a year to make. And it is a uh, 3D animated film. So this is a video um, that I created um, using computer graphics technology. Mm -hmm. And in this film, we follow a journey uh, through different surreal and otherworldly spaces. And throughout this journey, we encounter um, a bunch of wolves. And these wolves are uh, stealing the regalia of a monarch. So mm -hmm. they're stealing a scepter, which is an ancient symbol of power, uh, an orb, which has also been used to represent power, and a, uh, a coronation robe, an ermine coat. And so we'll talk about all of these symbols um, and where they come from uh, you know, throughout the course of this talk today. Yeah, so uh, we have a little treat. Um, we're going to show a little clip of Jonathan's latest work, Den of Wolves. A little choppy. <laughs> um, so what you're looking at is uh, um, a scene uh, from Den of Wolves. And in this work, we have a, uh, of course, the Capitol building uh, in DC, um, which is where I live. I live in Washington, DC. Um, and throughout all my practice, I've always dealt with the architecture of power. So looking at spaces and um, architecture that represent power and authority. And in this case, um, 
with this film, uh, you know, about a year ago when I was starting to work on this film, I decided to, you know, why not use DC, which is where I live. Um, and so here we see this environment, which is a very recognizable Capitol building, but it's sort of um, gentrified in a way with this uh, Whole Foods, this organic garden uh, version, my version of Whole Foods. And then there's also later on an Apple store. And so it's um, it's a rather strange and uh, surreal take on the Capitol building, but one that speaks to certain issues in our um, in our society today with corporate power structures and uh, our reliance on consumer culture and and this and that. Um, so it's looking like we're having some trouble playing it. So <laughs> and so truly, um, you, I, I encourage everyone to see this in person. To yeah. fully capture how awesome the piece. That's is. how you're supposed to see it. You're supposed to see it in person, um, and this is great because it's been um, a while since I've been able to really exhibit my video installations large scale. And although we've done some successful online presentations of my work, um, there's just no there's no uh, comparison between uh, seeing this large scale. And this piece is about uh, projected in the Walters is about 12 foot wide. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a very detailed piece. And so you really absorb a lot of the detail uh, in that work um, when you're seeing it in person. Um, but there's also clips online too, if you want to see it. Yes. And you had mentioned that there are specific anxieties that you explore in Den of Wolves. Yeah. So I like to think of, this video installation and a lot of my other video installations is kind of like a, a dream, kind of like a collective dream. You know, in our in our dreams, a lot of our fears and our anxieties about our lives sort of manifest as different uh, symbols and different imagery. Um, and so, I wanted to try and figure out, you know, sort of collectively, what are, what are we scared of about about the future, about technology, about corporate uh, kind of you know our corporate power. And so I'm sort of picking a lot of different symbols and mixing these together into these very dreamlike uh, mm -hmm. worlds and these very dreamlike vignettes. And for me, it's this is sort of about unearthing or eliciting a lot of some of the fears and anxieties we have about the future, about our over-reliance on technology, about the uh, extent of corporate power, about mm -hmm. um, the, our obsessions with consumerism and consumer culture. And so... It's a, um, it's kind of like, uh, you kind of think of this work as like therapy in a way for an uncertain future. And it was um, quite interesting because I sketched out a lot of the ideas in this piece, um, which include things like an empty uh, supermarket, you know, a, a supermarket with empty shelves or um, these retail environments that are totally abandoned and empty. Um, and it's, I sketched all this out at the beginning of 2020 before the uh, pandemic started. Um, so it was really interesting to see some interesting parallels between the work I was creating and what was happening in our, um, in the world. And of course, then after, uh, you know, in January too, um, we had the attacks on the Capitol building and then, you know, I was using this imagery in my work. Um, so I think it's quite interesting how, um, how a lot of the symbols I was using for this piece uh, became potent symbols um, yeah. in the past in the past year in the news and our in our sort of uh, our collective conscious. For sure, and truly, the other part of your work that I find very interesting is this interplay of symbols of power from both you know past and the present symbols of power. Like you've you've um, identified a comparison here for us. Yeah, absolutely. So this uh, work you see on the the left is a piece that's in the Walters. It's from the series Centuries, which I talked about before. And this is very large. It's about printed about nine feet tall or so. And so this is a very imposing work. It's a very sort of um, ominous work. It's very it has a has a strong presence in the gallery space. It's very confrontational. And um, this work was really directly influenced by um, the. Uh, this painting that you see uh, by Angra, uh, which I got to see in person and during a visit to Paris not that long ago, um, you know, before the pandemic started. And um, this, uh, I was interested in how Angra depicted Napoleon. Um, I was interested in the detail, sort of the lusciousness of the gold and the velvet and the ermine coat that you see. And then also compositionally, just, um, you know, the the sort of imposing, uh, really dominant, um, you know, composition that um, sort of 
you know, creates this really powerful presence. And so I wanted to uh, explore some of these ideas, but instead of making it about this historical figure, mm -hmm. it's sort of about technology. Uh, because when you look at the details in the centuries piece, you'll see a lot of recognizable bits of technology. So all the, the details in there, which you can't see here, you have to go again, go in person because this is a very large piece. Then you can go up close to it and see all the details in person. Uh, you'll see things like, you know, um, you know, credit card readers or, you know, buttons, USB ports and, um, you know, vents uh, and, um, you know, uh, other consumer electronics. Um, and all of these things are mixed in with gold and Baroque architecture mm -hmm. and this rather, um, tactile feeling um uh, uh fabric surfaces as well yeah and that those power symbols continue through den of wolves and you know here we have again the ermine coat appears again exactly uh and this is a uh a scene from den of wolves and uh, the ermine coat um it has been used in Western uh, culture for hundreds of years um, to represent power, to represent a monarch or a, a person of power, oftentimes is used as a coronation. So when a, uh, a king or a queen is elevated to that status, uh, they usually are in a procession with uh, the coat. Uh, it actually comes from ermines, uh, which are you know uh, you know an animal, uh, and um, and those the little black things are the tail of the mm -hmm. ermine. Um, uh, they're usually affixed to the coat, um, and so it's it's interesting. There's a tactile quality to this. Um, to this idea, you know, this sort of ermine coat, this fur, this soft fur, there's this mm -hmm. tension between the natural and the synthetic because this is something that's made from, of course, um, you know, the hides of these animals. And it's, um, it, it, it has a, a look that's, you know, uh, very interesting to me. And it, and so there's all these different tensions that are, and symbols that are, you know, within this piece. And so one of the, this is one of the items that we see the wolves uh, with. Uh, in addition to uh, the scepter and the orb, which are these kinds of three main symbols of of, of power, and so um, and yeah, so there's you know you could go to the Walters and you could see uh, several examples of of large powerful people uh, being um, you know with with an ermine coat. Here, of course, you have a, a, a Doge um, from uh, from Venice um, mm -hmm. uh, in in, a, in one of these coats. So yeah, and then to continue the. Um, sumptuousness of the animals, both as in your story in uh, Den of Wolves, but also as luxury goods here represented by the bejeweled Martin's head. This is a great piece. I mean, this is one of my favorite pieces in the Walters uh, collection. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I visited the Walters several times, of course, before making this piece. And I, and I wonder too, just how, you know, and I, I, I was drawn to this piece and I've always kind of tried to, um, you know, very influenced by museums and by historical artworks, as you can see. So I'm sure this piece made an influence um, and you could definitely see a lot of connections here on the right with one of the other wolves from the animation. Um, but yeah, the smart teen's head, it's just, it's, it's such a wild, surreal piece. Um, and uh, the idea too, that this was of course worn, this was mm -hmm. something that was worn by uh, the aristocrats uh, in Italy. And, um, and so as, as a, uh, like a, you know, like a scarf or something, you know, and, um, and it, yeah, it's just, it's just a wild piece. Apparently the tongue moves too. There's like a chain <laughs> to control the tongue. And um, I, yeah, so it's a, it's an insane piece of jewelry. Um, but uh, I think one of the things that this touches on is the idea of excess and decadence. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the interesting, this is something that I've been, one of the reasons why I'm interested in exploring a lot of this Baroque and Rococo uh, imagery in my, in my work is because, you know, we tend to think of the Baroque society as of course, very decadent, you know, huge income inequality, a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, it was, you know, it, it was, and I'm, I think what I'm trying to do is draw some parallels between mm -hmm. our, our society, which I think is, in, is also very decadent, you know, with our, our consumer technology and our, our consumer culture. And, and so it's in, it's in a way drawing some of these parallels between the excess and decadence of the past and the, 
excess and decadence of our time. Truly. And can you tell us why you chose wolves? Yeah, so I when I create these works, I talked a little bit about them being dreams. And it's interesting because, of course, when you look at mythology, it's often connected to the unconscious and dreams, are, of course, connected to the unconscious. And so in the same way that a lot of fears and anxieties sort of appear in our dreams, they also appear in our mythologies. And this is uh, an important aspect of how, you know, mythology is um, developed, uh, I think. And, you know, the, through the unconscious and through a lot of the, the sort of the, the deep-seated human psyche. And so uh, as somebody that frequently reinterprets or uh, remixes a lot of ancient mythologies uh, to create my work, uh, wolves kept appearing and they kept appearing in association with, with kings and with a position of power and authority. Um, one of the oldest ones was a Greek mythology of King uh, Lycion, and uh, he was turned into a wolf. Um, this was in Ovid's Metamorphosis, and he was a, a king of Arcadia. And he, uh, this is where we get the modern werewolf uh, idea from. Uh, and here there's a, a, this great piece in the Walters, which is depicting a Russian fairy tale or myth of a firebird and a wolf and Ivan, um, who is who is just a very sort of generic uh, character. But uh, again, when you look, read this fairy tale and the story, um, it's very much connected to uh, a king and power. There were these golden apples um, that uh, the firebird was stealing and then the wolf got involved. And, and it's a co complicated fairy tale. But um, anyways, the whole point is that there's a lot of connection between aristocracy and, and, the, mm -hmm. and, and a monarchy and a king in, in this uh, narrative that's being depicted here on this um, cigar box. Um, so, and of course there's apples too in the piece too, yeah. where this wolf that you see on the left steals, um, the orb from, a uh, a basket of apples at the Whole Foods. So, um, so it's, um, so the wolf keeps appearing, uh, in connection with, with Kings and with monarchy and with power. And I'm, and I'm not exactly sure why either. And I, but mm -hmm. I'm sort of exploring some of that in, uh, in my work here. That's great. It's fascinating. And here um, we're just making a comparison of the architecture that's mm -hmm. you know, very much of a feature of Byzantine and neoclassical architecture, but also lends this otherworldly aspect to the Capitol building, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, when I first started sketching out this piece, I was actually doing a residency in Italy, um, and uh, I was really interested in a lot of the ceiling frescoes and a lot of the architecture of the uh, palaces and the basilicas and the churches there, and uh, also architecture, sometimes real, sometimes imagined, that was depicted in uh, historical works from that time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so, yeah. So when you when you see a lot of the frescoes and when you see a lot of the artworks from that time, you see this kind of neoclassical, um, you know, Baroque architecture, um, and that you also see it in the Capitol, of course, too, because it was designed to be like that. There's, of course, a great fresco on the ceiling of the Capitol building. Um, and so um, anyways, so um, y this is a great example too, of just how you see a lot of that architecture come in. And it's, um, it's very otherworldly, as you say, um, and that's something I'm interested in about it. And it's also, um, it just, there's something like innate about it that speaks to like something, this like otherworldly power. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that's what I'm trying to get at uh, fundamentally with this work is, you know, trying to depict this sort of, yeah, this like otherworldly sense of power. Um, and, you know, where is this power and authority coming from, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, these drawing these connections between, you know, from Silicon Valley to, you know, modern corporate and, and uh, culture today. Um, you know, this is sort of what the work is, is trying to get at, um, not in any specific way necessarily, but, you know, by sort of drawing these parallels and these associations, perhaps there could be some more critical insight into, um, you know, who we are and where we're going today. Mm -hmm. So to take a step back, this is 2021, and uh, you'll be f in our presentation, you're featuring a work that's as old as 2010. Mm -hmm. So within that span, how has your voice evolved throughout your artistic practice? Yeah, so um, I guess, I, I mean, I began making artwork, um, you know, in the same vein that what I'm doing today, 
uh, I guess it's been, um, yeah, like 12 years now or so. Uh, what you're seeing here is a work from, uh, well, the main thing that you're seeing here is a work from 2015. Um, and so I think my practice has changed a little bit in the past year, a lot, I think, because, um, again, there's been like this, a much stronger um, detachment from the physicality of, of seeing a work, of exhibiting artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have actually haven't made any sculptures recently, although sculptures are a big uh, part of my practice and always have been. Uh, so here, what you're seeing is some examples of how I use digital fabrication technologies to bring out a lot of the themes and imagery uh, and motifs from my animations and my other uh, still work uh, mm -hmm. into sculptural form. And so you're seeing here a, um, a, a piece being carved out of Carrara marble. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a um, you know pretty sizable sculpture made out of marble. And it was all designed initially on the computer. So I used, like uh, yeah, so you can kind of see the process here. Um, so I'm using um, the same software that I used to make my animations. I can sort of extract um, a lot of that data that the, some, what we call a 3D model from that mm -hmm. process and uh, fabricated into various physical materials such as uh, Carrara marble. Uh, and this work was based off of a painting uh, of which you have a sort of a, 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 an imitation or a copy of uh, in, the, in the Walters. Um, on the left here, you see this painting by Josefina. Um, and this was based off of, and she based this painting off of another painting by Francisco de Zurbaran, mm -hmm. uh, for also, you know, all from, which was from the Baroque times, um, the Spanish Baroque era of painting. And um, there's a lot of like religious significance to this uh, piece, but I was quite interested in um, this idea of like a, a sacrificial lamb and the way that which it was constrained and bound. Um, and so I, I sort of imagine that form, that, that animal sort of uh, constrained in this leather like skin so mm -hmm. that it was sort of constrained or constricted within this uh, leather like skin. And so uh, it's like this tuffeted luxury skin that's sort of um, uh, consuming this, uh, this form. So it's a bit of a dark piece, even though it looks very bright and it has these kinds of colors that are um, or this, these sort of textures that are very, you know, seductive and, and, um, it, you know, but it, it does have a, a you know, a, that, that sort of darker element to it as well. Yeah. Um, but like those original paintings too, because you can kind of go up and you can see the detail and the fur on that. So it's, um, these were very interesting, uh, interesting paintings. And so this was my sort of exploration of that into a sculptural form. And I think in the next slide, you can see some also some influence by uh, those those series of paintings here where you have this sort of sacrificial um, polar bear. Um, this mm. was one of the early works. Um, and this work was from 2010. This was probably one of the first successful pieces that I had as an artist. This was reviewed in the Washington uh, Post. Um, this uh, and. It was an exhibition in DC at the Hamiltonian Gallery, and this was so this was like yeah one of my first real successful moments as an artist uh, uh, with showing this work. And so what you're looking at this is a, a three minute animation that shows a polar bear um, sort of starving to death. So it's a dark imagery, and it was based off of a video uh, of a polar bear starving to death. And this especially uh, back then this was a huge issue with climate change and. Um, uh, the, the, the polar bears um, were um, not being able to find food. And so um, I sort of took the motion uh, for, uh, from the video, um, animated it, and created this piece. Um, although, of course, what's different, what's unique about this polar bear is that it's sort of uh, tattooed with corporate uh, uh corporate uh, logo, specifically the Coca-Cola logo. So you have the famous Coca-Cola wave and the color uh, there. And uh, the polar bear was and is a um, uh, an important mascot for Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. And so these discrepancies were very interesting to me. Um, on the one hand, you have this um, terrible situation through climate change that was happening. And on the other hand, you have this, uh, you know, polar bears enjoying drinking Coca-Cola up in the North Pole, you know? And so uh, I was exploring these discrepancies, you know, of how we experience, uh, you know, the imagery. Um, and so that's what this piece sort of came out as. And it becomes a this ghostly image that's projected onto the wall where the 
rectangle from the projector is sort of hidden and obscured and you just have this ghostly presence of mm -hmm. this uh, beast. So it's kind of like a memorial in a way. It's meant to create a little bit of empathy because it's also life size. Yeah. And it's presented to you like on the floor. So like you're, it's like you're really physically engaging with uh, the imagery. And it's also meant to, I think, raise some awareness about climate change, but also explore these discrepancies we have and how we uh, experience things through the media and through technology and sort of what that technology mediation does to how we perceive reality. Yeah. And certainly your um, exploration of the intersection between art and pop culture really does place you in a specific art lineage, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a work like this uh, is very much in the lineage of pop art and uh, artists, of course, like Andy Warhol and uh, many mm -hmm. other uh, uh, artists. There's something um, that they were exploring that was very much about our consumer culture, of course. But I think it was going a little further than just, you know, riffing on corporate symbols and corporate logos. I think they were trying to really get at the psyche of what in American culture and society is driving this obsession with consumerism. And, uh, and so they, you know, Andy Warhol had some darker works as well, whether it was the electric chair series or the car crash series. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think I'm very much interested in that lineage too, trying to drive at the psyche of, of this obsession with consumer culture and, um, you know, planned obsolescence and the damage this is doing to our environment and, you know, what this technology, this rapid development of technology and our obsessions with this uh, are about and like, where is this coming from, you know, from, uh, um, and so that I think was some of what I'm trying to explore and some of what I was interested in with those, uh, that lineage of American pop art. Yeah. And so with these two works um, for the Sondheim exhibition, um, what does the opportunity of the Sondheim Prize and its visibility mean to you and your artistic voice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is a very big deal. Um, it's a huge honor. Um, and the, I think the biggest honor is just being able to exhibit my work with such another, uh, which other great group of artists. I mean, the other artists in the exhibition are amazing. Um, and the work is amazing. And being able to just see the wide range uh, of artwork that's being created in this region and also the quality of the artwork being created mm -hmm. in this region uh, is really uh, something special and incredible. And I'm just, I'm just happy to be a part of it. Um, and I, I think for me, that's the biggest, you know, gain out of this is just being a part of and being able to see um, so much incredible work that's being created and everybody's bringing in their own unique voice and their own unique background and their own unique approach and style and process. And it's all on display in the exhibition. And that's, really good just the you know just the variety is really amazing to see um so yeah no this visibility is great it's a, a huge honor um and uh it's great to be this is actually my the second time showing in the walters i had a mm -hmm. exhibition based off of the faberge egg using a lot of this uh themes and motifs and uh that we were talking about in this artist talk here um, of course, that relates to the Fabergé egg, and uh, there's one of the original Fabergé eggs in the collection. Uh, so a few years ago, we did an exhibition like that. So it's great to be back here under uh, an even more uh, prominent context. Oh, we're, we're definitely very glad to have you back, Jonathan. Right. And so we have a question from the audience mm -hmm. um, by John Martinek. Um, he says, by using both contemporary and classical imagery, how does how does your work relate to us? Does it what does it necessarily relate to a certain demographic or generation? I think there's a, a number of other artists that many of them are engaged with technology that are really interested in this idea of the Baroque, you know, this idea mm -hmm. of the sort of maximalist uh, aesthetic, you know, and using that maximalist aesthetic to explore, like I said, a lot of that decadence of our culture and a lot of that excess of our culture and sort of questioning in it and starting to draw some attention to, you know, why we, why do we have all this excess? Why are we, you know, um, you know, and so I think there's a number of artists that do that. And so, I, yeah, I think that it's, it's, you know, you could fit it into, uh, into that. There's a curator at the Albrecht Knox uh, gallery, Tina Rivers Ryan, and she is working on something called the digital Baroque. And so artists that are, 
engage with digital technologies, but are also engaged with these very maximalist aesthetics that you might associate with um, the older Baroque eras or Rococo eras of, 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 of Western art. Great, so one last question before we go. What are you looking forward to most as an artist right now? Well, I think um, this is a great, it's, this is like, this is really, I mean, I have a, a lot going on right now, um, in, including the, uh, the Walters art exhibition, um, the group exhibition at the Walters, which is great. And then I also have a solo exhibition in New York. And these are the first physical exhibitions that I've had since, you know, the pandemic started back in March. Um, and so this is um, a, just a, a wonderful time to really uh, be able to experience artwork in a gallery, you know, in a museum space, um, which is how I, you know, design these works to be exhibited. And uh, so that's fantastic. And I hope to see just more of that and hope to see other artist shows. Uh, also, I'm really looking forward to being able to visit museums again. Um, so many museums have been closed and shut down. And that's been such a huge part of how I, you know, uh, what I'm inspired by. You know, I'm really truly, it sounds corny, but I'm really inspired by, you know, going to a museum and looking at these historical artworks. And um, it's really important to my practice. And so missing that has been a huge issue. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, this past year with the, you know, these lockdowns and the quarantines, I've been very much a little uninspired. I've just been making work and busy and staying busy and working, um, but I've been a little bit uninspired. So I'm very much looking to uh, to travel again to visit museums and to start uh, new bodies of artwork. Wonderful. Yes, I think we all agree. We are looking forward to being out and about again and seeing art again. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for being with us here today. Unfortunately, yeah, that's all the time we have for this talk. Again, thank you, Jonathan, for being with us. And a big thank you to our digital team for playing assist in this program. And also an even bigger thank you to all of you, our audience, for sharing this experience with us. We welcome you back with more programs on our social platforms. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.